Now, uh, accompanying me on the piano, playing Eternal Father, Strong to Save, will be our church pianist, who is also my wonderful, <laughs> lovely, extraordinarily beautiful, <laughs> <laughs> and other woman, Alice Stringer. Scripture says, greater love hath no one than this, than to lay down one's life his friends. To every soldier who serves America, we offer our thanks and our appreciation. Their sacrifice we honor. We proudly salute each and every member of our armed forces for their efforts sacrifice of life. Our veterans who served on land, who served on sea, who served in the air, we salute them. Scripture says, you therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. These brave men and women protected America. Without them, we would have been engulfed by the tyrants of the sin-filled world. But on this Memorial Day, we honor every son and every daughter lost in wars so afar. They define this wonderful country. They define this great country with their sacrifice. Our prayers victoriously lift up the officers as they guide and guided our troops. We salute them. Let us, as we observe Memorial Day this year, extend me, to these brave soldiers our love, our rapture, admiration. Through all the endeavor, our precious, precious Lord bless them. To the buglers who sounded the charge for our nation, and for the drummers who lost their lives beating out the cadence of the march. We salute these brethren, these soldiers of the United States, and we honor them this Memorial Day. Scripture says, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. There stands a tomb in Washington, D.C., in which lies an unknown soldier. In front of this stone sarcophagus burns a flame for this no-name soldier lost in battle. On this Memorial Day, we remember this patriot with a flame of freedom that will never be extinguished. Praise God for all soldiers gone, but can we say together, not for cotton? Thank you. My 
ask you all to stand for the posting of the colors, please. may be seated. I'm going to read your memorial list. Howard Dean Anderson, Air Force. Robert Anuitsky, Air Force. Ricard Lee Bach, Navy. Aaron Benham, Army. Roselle Bennett, Army. Franklin Biggers, Navy. Virgil Biggers Army, Zern Biggers Army, Harry E. Brown, Michigan National Guard, James Brown Army, Richard H. Brown Navy, Roger Brown Air Force, William Y. Brown Air Force, Chaplain Calvin Campbell Air Force, Jeffrey Carmel, Australian Air Corps, Ralph E. Colburn Army, Gothel Debler Army, J. Stanley DeBoer Army, Charles T. Durham, Navy. John Ferns, Army. Cecil Bud Fisher, Army. Lawrence Fisher, Army. James W. Fox, Air Force. John Fox, Navy. Marvin Fox, Marine Corps. Chaplain Harold Gardner, Army. Albert Guido, Navy. Stephen Hart, Marine Corps. Alexander Hess, Air Force. Captain Robert M. Hodges, MD, Air Force. Jim Holton, Navy. Walter Hubbard, Navy. John Kenneth Hull, Air Force. Fred Kosher, Army. Paul Kundra, Air Force. Evan A. Lee, Navy. Harry Lescano, Army. Robert C. Link, Army. Joseph Lopez, Army. Roger Luna, Marine Corps. John W. Mayer, Sr., Army. Manuel Maldonado, Navy. Eugene Mallory, Air Force. Paul Mann, Marine Corps and Army. Kenneth D. Marcus, Navy. William Marcus, Army. Terry Martinez, Air Army. <clears throat> George Masters, Army. Evan McFarland, Air Force. James Metcalf, Navy and Army. Roger Mills, Army. John Moore, Air Force. Emil W. Ninsky, Arm Army Air Corps. Julian Ortiz, Navy. Mike Ortiz, Air Force. Wilbur Robinson, Navy. Ed Russell, Army, killed in action in World War II. Paul Schoonover, Navy. Hal Scherer, Marine Corps. 
Marcel Scherer Army, Jesse Smith Army, Bud Snow Navy, Daryl Snyder Navy, Raymond E. Sparlin Army, William Sprinkle Army, Walter H. Stevens Army, Hal Anthony Stidger Marine Corps, Richard Tierink Army Rangers, John Teftiller Army, Charlestown Navy, Chet Turley Army, Gerald Turley UDT Special Forces, Alexander Vasquez Army, Joseph Vasquez Lopez Army, Manuel Vasquez Army, Mike Vickner Marine Corps, First Lieutenant Earl Warren Army, George Wendell Air Force, Charles Wimpy Army, Leland Wimpy Marine Corps, Mark Weinoff Navy. This morning, when uh, Pastor Marshall asked me to speak this today, I was thinking about memorial, talk about the military services, and I know, as I said earlier, they have our back. We're able to do what we do because of them. So today, I'd like to speak about the title is, Who Truly Has Our Back? Being a youth pastor, I hear that saying a lot. These kids are playing games, video games, hey, I got your back. Going to the football games, I've gone to a lot of football games this year, hey, I got your back. And you know, it's good to hear them say that. Out there playing games at Fellowship Hall. Dodgeball, tag, whatever we play. You always hear, I got your back. I remember saying when I was a kid, I got your back. But who really has our back? Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He's the one that has our back and that's the only one that matters. You know, I'm gonna get a little nostalgic on you here for a minute. And uh, some of you younger ones won't understand what I'm about to say. Because when I was about 10 years old, that was quite a bit ago, we went outside and played. We rode our bikes. And on my block where I live, we had 10 boys all about within three years of the same age. So we got together, rode our own stingrays with the banana seats, sissy bars, got together, went out in the morning, played, depending on what time of year it was, played sports all day long. Come home for lunch, get back out there, come home when it got dark. That was our life. No, no technology back then. I mean, we were lucky to have a black and white TV with uh, pliers to change the channel and I was remote control, you know? But, um. I had this one friend, I would call him Johnny, because I don't want to, uh, you know, just, instead of, you remember the old movie Dragnet, names are changed to protect the innocent, names are changed to protect the guilty. <laughs> I had a friend Johnny, met him when I was about 10 years old, good buddy, we always went out together, and Johnny's favorite saying was, I got your back. And the reason why I said that, because he's the one that always started the fights. We well, could be playing a game, baseball games, you know, football, take football, tag football, and he'll start a fight. So as good friends, we are in a fight together, scraping and everything, and, and we, you know, as, as we know back then, there was no guns, no knives, nothing like that, you know, just fisticuffs, no big deal. End up shaking hands at the end, but every time the fight will end, Johnny never threw a punch. He's over there by the water bottle, drinking water or something like that. Never threw a punch, but he's the one that started it. I'm thinking, hey, wait a minute now. This, this ain't going the way it should be going. Even when we got to high school, the same way. We go away to other high schools to go watch you know, sports and 
by the time it's high, we go watch the women's sport, the girls' sports, girls' volleyball and softball, whatever. He will start a fight every single time because he'll find one of the guys there whose girlfriend's there and he'll talk to the girlfriend. And right before he went out, he goes, hey, you guys got my back? Sure, we'll end up fighting again. Fight ends, no big deal. Johnny's talking to a different girl. It's like, Johnny, what are you doing? You start these fights and you're not even throwing a punch. We know the black guy, but like I said, there was no knives or guns. It went on all the way through a, being a young adult. And um, the bar scene in Old Sacramento, same thing happens. Johnny was star fight. We're fighting, we're kick, getting kicked out of the bar. Johnny's on the other side of the bar with another girl having a drink while we're all getting kicked out. So finally I had to say, you know what? Enough's enough, Johnny. I'm not going anywhere with you anymore. He was upset, and you know, that's just the way life was. I got tired of fighting, you know? And um, the reason I bring this up, who really has her back, I would like to talk to a young boy who knew who had their back. I'm going a little bit into the Old Testament tonight. Hope you don't mind. This young man know, knew who had his back at all times. And we're speaking about David. Most people, when they hear David's name, the first, David from the Bible, the first thing they think about, David and Goliath. I mean, even people that don't know the Bible that well. You know, David, oh, the guy who beat the giant. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. But there's so much more to it than just him killing a giant. There's so much more to it. David was about uh, 15, right around 15 years old when uh, the war against the Philistines were going on. David's older brothers all had to go out to war. David wanted to go, but he was younger. So his dad said, no, you know what? You need to stick around, take care of the flocks. He wasn't too happy about it, but that's what he had to do. He was the youngest, his brothers were out there fighting. But then one day, uh, David's father said, hey, you know what? You need to go out there, check up on your brothers, bring back some news, take them some food. Because uh, if they wanted to eat good back then when they fought, you had to bring your own food or supply your own food somewhere or another. It wasn't like, you know, today, thank goodness that we have United States has the funds to feed their, feed their servicemen as they should. And a little bit off the point, we need to take care of them when they come back instead of letting things happen the way they are. But let me get back to the story here. That's just an old personal feeling there. So um, when David got there, he saw the commotion. They're across the valleys from each other, the Philistine army, Israelites. And um, he got excited, as most young boys do. He's being nosy. He wants to see what's going on. Because he's way in the background, getting there, talking to his brothers. His brothers, hey, what are you doing here, man? Get home. Dad sent me here. He sent me here to check up on you guys. But then he heard uh, someone talking, not very nicely, about our Lord and the Lord's army. So David wanted to find out who exactly is talking this. Who's talking, so who's talking smack about us? And why aren't we doing something about it? And you know who it is? It's Goliath. Supposedly nine feet tall, just this huge warrior, been fighting since he's been young. Just, he'd have been a good center in the NBA, actually. So David went down to Saul, and, who was leading the armies, and asked him, uh, what is he doing about this? How can you let this guy talk about God? And um, let's get into scripture. Scripture, 1 Samuel 17, 32, 37. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart or down of this Philistine. Your servant will go out and fight him. Saul replied, you're not able to go out there against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a boy. He has been fighting. He's been a fighting man from his youth. But David replied, your servant has been keeping sheep when a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock. I went after it. I struck it, rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who delivered me from the paws of the lion and the paws of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, go and let the Lord be with you. 
So Saul, the first thing Saul did was try to get David into his armor. David was a little guy. David put it on. Hey, I can't move around in this. I don't need this stuff. Why? Because David had faith that our God would protect him. Our God would deliver him from any. You know, as, as I said in Scripture, I can see David all pumped up. Because he's telling him, hey, I killed a lion. I killed a bear. I'm a kid. I did pretty much with my bare hands. I could just see David. You know, kids, you go watch a football game. Some, they make a touch on their, oh, they're all excited and everything, all pumped up, adrenaline pumping. You know, like if uh, you go out to a soft, one of our softball games, see one of our guys hit a home run? All oh, the teams jump. Yeah, yeah, we're all excited. Or for um, example, some of my age are m- maybe a little older. We get excited when we get up in the morning. Nothing hurts. No bones are creaking. And we stand up saying, oh, this is going to be a great day. You know? That's how he must have felt, really excited. I believe when David went up against that lion and a bear, it wasn't really protecting the flocks. It was God was preparing him for a bigger fight, a bigger war, and that was the war of the nation of Israel, to save a nation, to save God's people. That's what God was preparing him for. What is God preparing you for? Age doesn't make a difference. You could be nine or 90. Age doesn't make a difference. God is preparing you for something. He's preparing something in your community. It's for the ones in school. Is he preparing something for you to do something in school? We don't know. I don't know what God's doing in your life right now. Whatever it is, it's, for, it's gonna be for the glory. Remember. God has your back. So all we got to remember is God has our back no matter what we do. But in order for him to have our back, we got to give him our heart. We got to receive him as our Lord and Savior, our Heavenly Father. Because if we don't give him our heart, he's not going to have our back. It's scripture. It's a decision each and every one of us needs to make. We're up here, we just give you the word, Pastor Les, Marsha and I. It's your own decision. As we like to put it, it's your free will. Let me read a little bit more scripture if, you, if it's okay with you. 1 Samuel 17, 40, 45 to 46. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin. But I come against you in the name of of the Lord Almighty. Right there, he's telling him, you know what? I got it. God's with me. My God is with me. He's not afraid. The God of the army of Israel, whom you have defied, this day the Lord will hand you over to me. I will strike you down, cut off your head. Today I'll give the carcass of the Philistine army to the birds of the air, the beasts of the earth, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. Now, I don't know how many of you guys um, have read the Old Testament. If you read the Old Testament, God was ruthless. You hear a lot about cutting off heads, slaughtering villages, and he didn't care who it was, man, woman, child. He wanted to make a point. These are my people. Do not interfere with them. We're his people. God has our back. We are God's people. The gospel is for everybody. I know at the very beginning, it was for the Jewish people. That's what it was for. But they turned his back on him. They spread the word to the Gentile. And who's a Gentile? Each and every one of us is Gentile. The gospel's for us. Yes, he defeated Goliath. But what needs to be noticed so Dave did it. Dave did what he did because God had his back. And throughout our lives, have we made decisions to do things we were worried about? We don't know what is going to happen. If we're doing it for the right reason, that's the reason for our Lord. God has our back. The one person who doesn't have our back is Satan. 
The devil doesn't come to you with his ugly red face or scary horns. He comes to you disguised as everything you ever wanted. He comes to you as that big new Lexus, Mercedes, the 102 inch TV, <laughs> high def sports center. But everything we want, what we crave is because it's out there. It's put upon us every day. This is the way you need to live. Look at TV. The shows on the television now, they show shows that these people got everything, but they're not living the Christian life. For example, and I, I, I got to admit, when a new show comes on, I do try to watch it at least once so I know what it's about before I make my judgment. There's that show out, Christy, Christy Knows Best. Try watching that. Those people are ignorant. I mean, the decisions they make is terrible. They could be, in life, they could be living a life of faith and helping many, but they don't. Housewives of whatever city they're in that day. <laughs> I don't know. These women, oh my goodness gracious. They show they got everything in the world and they're fighting among each other, having a good old time in life, but how good could that time be if they don't have Christ in their heart? I mean, it's, it's satisfaction for the moment. But what is your everlasting eternal life going to be? There's not going to be one for them. And let's not forget the queens of queens of queens of drama, the Kardashians. I got nothing more to say, but I'm just like, oh my goodness gracious. I mean, well, you guys know what I mean about those people, those that family. What a mess these days in TV. You know, personally, I don't have a big house. My bank account ain't plentiful at all, believe me. But I am blessed. I'm blessed with the love and mercy and grace of my Savior, Jesus Christ who put a great family at home and a great church family for me. That's all the blessings I need because I got my love of my Savior. You know, there's a saying that I, I like a lot that, that's been around. As a pastor, we're not in it for the income. We're in it for the outcome. We're in it to, to build the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what we're doing. You know, has there been a time in your life when uh, you might have witnessed something, something that happened, and you didn't want to say nothing about it because you're afraid you might have to be a witness somewhere or someone might come back at you or something? Uh, not long ago, as many of you know, I deliver flowers part-time. I was on my way out from the shop, a van full of flowers, me and another young man. We're right here on the corner of uh, 30th and T Street. I'm standing at a red light, and I see a car coming, and they got a red light too. But this young lady had her headphones on and she's looking down at her phone while she's driving. She runs the red light. Car comes off the freeway and just plows right into it. She gets hit and she's still looking at her phone while she got hit. She looks up. So I pull over right away. I got a van full of flowers. The young, the young kid I'm with goes, what are you doing? I said, I got to make sure no one's hurt before I go on. I would, feel, I would feel guilty if I didn't stop. Stop. By God's grace, no one got hurt. But I left my card. If you need a witness, let me know. You know, give me a call. She was looking at her phone when you got in the wreck. But there has been times where it's like, man, do I really want to get involved? And they show it all the time on TV. Some guy might be up some woman and there's people standing around and they're filming it. And they're not calling 911. You know, they're not doing anything about it. And they, I seen one of the interview, well, I didn't want to get involved, I was scared. They might, you know what, we can't be scared. Because God will have our back, we're doing it for our right reasons. And we just gotta remember that. Remember what God told Joshua. I will never leave you nor forsake you, Joshua 1.5. There is so much we could do in the name of Christ. You know, we could, if you don't already have one, start a home Bible study with your family, your friends, your neighbors. If nothing else, pray for your family, pray for your church. Ask God to bless them, to be with them, the ones that are ill, ones that are hurt, ones that are employed. We need to pray for our church family. It doesn't hurt to make phone calls. We've got a lot of homebound people here at this church. 
make a phone call. I know we all can't go and work and witness. We all can't be missionaries, health reasons, age. But there is still something you could, you know, being a Christian, we cannot retire from it. Being a Christian, our job goes until we take our last breath and our next breath to be in the arms of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We cannot give up on his work. It is what we are told to do. You know, send a card. It doesn't hurt to send a card. Make it a family thing if you have kids or grandkids. Let them see you do it. Joshua 24, 15. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Be an example. You know, what I like to do, I just finished school, but when I was in school, I just like going to my garage. I got a TV in there, like watching football, whatever in there. There's times when I shut it all off, my garage door's open, I'm sitting in my desk chair, have my buddy sitting next to me, Thor. Uh, Bull Mastiff, Chocolate Lab, good dog. And he could sit there, fall asleep. I'll fall asleep in my chair, he's snoring right next to me. But there's times I like just sitting there and praying for each neighbor. I might not know their name, but I will pray for their house to have Christ's love be upon them. I don't know what they're going through. It doesn't matter to me what they're going through, but I will pray for them. The main thing is we need to be in contact with our Savior at all times. Whatever it takes. Remember, God doesn't have a cell phone, but I talk to him. God doesn't have a Facebook page, but I'm his friend. God doesn't have a Twitter account, but I follow him. Who has your back? Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has your back. You know, I've uh, been asked this question, and I didn't understand it at first. I couldn't understand why I was asked. But right now we have challenges in this church. We really do. And I've been asked what's going to happen to the church with pastor being sick. I didn't understand the question. I really didn't understand the question. What, you know, what do you mean? Well, what's going to happen with the church? Where's the church going to go? I mean... Attendance gets low. What's going to happen with the church? And I, and I, I took a minute to think about it, you know, but our pastor's coming back, number one. But I, I thought I told that person, we have a capable staff here. We have a capable board here that our decisions are going to be through Jesus Christ. We pray about it. Pastor Marsh and I get together. We try to get together every week, talk about what's going on in the church, and we pray about it. We pray about the pastor. We pray about everything going on in this church. And, our board, and I know our board prays about everything before we make a decision. God has our back. I just want to finish up with this real quick. Don't worship your pastor. Worship who your pastor is talking about. Heavenly Father, I just come to you, Lord, and just give you great thanks today, Lord. I just pray that open ears for today. And we know you are the one and the main one that has our back, Father. You are our king. You are the Lord of lords. And we must come to you in prayer, Father. But just be with us as a first church. Be with us this weekend, but let us all remember what this weekend means. I know we're all going to have our barbecues and all that. And Lord, that's fine. Let's all be safe. But let's just remember for the men and women of this great country that served. I just thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
are you as proud as I am to call America your country? Amen. Amen. The land of the free. We are free. We are free indeed. Um, two things I just wanted to mention real quickly is right after church today, Dennis, stand up for just a very quick minute. There's Dennis Howes. He's going to be the facilitator of the Financial Peace University, which starts this week, Wednesday. Class is filling up. I think we have about 10 people so far that have signed up. Even people outside the church are coming to this. So this is a very cool thing. Um, if you have questions about this, if you're not certain if this class is for you. Dennis will be meeting you in the fellowship hall immediately after church this morning to answer those questions, okay? And one other thing that I wanted to share with you, we have an outing happening in a couple of weeks. It's going to be on a Saturday, and it is called the Summer Splash, and we are going to have a dunk tank for Dave Anderson. <laughs> He's nodding his head back there. It's going to be all water games. We're going to open this up for volleyball. It is going to be a way. People, I know that there's, there's people that you know outside this church who are not here today. Maybe, maybe a neighbor, maybe a family member who wouldn't go to church otherwise. Bring them. This is an opportunity for us to build relationships. And if we can do it over a hot dog and a volleyball game or dunking Dave Anderson, I can find no better way to do that. But bring them. That's what this is for. And so we want to encourage you to take this and invite somebody to an event like that, okay? Is everybody good today? All right, I need to see you stand then. Don't forget to pray for people that are around you, people who may be not here today, people who are sick, people who just need Jesus, okay? And we're going to close in prayer this morning. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory both in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you.